Thanks very much, Ian. And hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Nick Babington. I'm a futurist. I've been living in Canada since 2008, which seemed like a pretty good time to leave the UK. Uh, I still come home quite often, but I haven't actually been home for three and a half years. I'm going back to where I grew up, which was Somerset, uh, in a small village down there. Um, I've spent time across the whole of the UK. I worked in consultancy for, for a large number of years for Companies like Capgemini, a whole number of different people as well. And uh, what happened about 10 years ago, I started arranging conferences with a good friend of mine who's now head of futures in Amazon. And we started looking at um, how the world was going to change with all the technology and humanity. And, you know, I ran conferences uh, in Vancouver, where I used to live. And I had people for flying from all over the world to speak about everything from you know, robotic surgery. And this was 2013, so quite a long time ago, all the way through to um, cyborg uh, technology implantation, a whole bunch of different stuff. And uh, what's interesting is that, that now I've sort of in, in the past sort of 10 years focused on futures. I, I acquired futurist.com last year. I've got the Futurist Think Tank, and I've just written a book for Bloomsbury called Facing Our Futures. And Facing Our Futures is this invitation to to, to organizationally and from a governmental perspective, shift ourselves away from sh that short term thinking towards a, a longer view and to incorporate longer term planning within organizations because short term thinking, as we know, can be quite limiting. So, this presentation is sort of a, a bit of fun and quite provocative. There's going to be some videos in there. I'm going to talk you through a little bit and we'll do a bit of a QA at the end of this. So, uh, if you've got questions and you're online, uh, drop the questions in the chat. If you've got questions in the uh in the room over there then please uh just write them down and hold them to the end and we'll get right through to that so as i said i grew up in somerset and uh, at the age of eight years old my father uh, gave me this book it's the osborne book of the future some of you in the room may have actually read this as well it's all sort of a provocative look at all the technologies that could exist in the year 2000 and beyond it, it had everything from like the hyperloop and civilizations living under the ocean lunar colonies and whatever whilst it was a little bit too far out and we haven't quite hit the mark in a lot of these respects at the age of eight it really it really inspired me to start thinking about what our futures could be you know like drawing pictures of colonizations really going deep into science fiction and whatever so in in reality i've been focused on thinking about futures for the majority of my my life uh, so it's interesting when we start to think about that because we start to think about okay what is the process around futures today within the the futurist think tank we, we talk about four um, particular steps in the work that we do we scan for signals and we derive and identify trends from a number of signals coming together we then write scenarios and stories and then we start to develop ideas of futures so we might be looking at 20 30 50 years um, in some respects you might even be looking out to long-term Term futures of 200 to 500 years, just to really explore some wild ideas of, of what could happen. I talk a lot about the, the water energy food nexus. I talk about waste. I talk about the industrial complex. Um, I'm not going to go into any of those today, but when I work with clients, I really start to frame sort of the, the, the failing industrial complex that we're constantly feeding to try and trying to keep you know all of our industries and, and uh, governmental capabilities alive and running running but what what i do and what the team does is you know we speculate we don't predict so there's no predictions in this presentation we explore and that's really important you know just to have fun and to play and to explore you know we don't develop strategy even though i come from a strategic background and typically at the end of futures processes and, and projects that we run, which can last you know, 12 to 16 weeks, we come back to the board of directors, we come back to this, this, the C-level um, management and we, we sit down and try and draw lines from those futures back to today. And that's a process called backcasting. But this is about a discipline, not a hyperbole. You know, we can, we can all uh, talk about Elon Musk until our faces go blue and talk about the future of space travel, electric vehicles, electric infrastructure. We can start to look at everyone from Peter Diamandis and whatever that, that, that tell these big uh, stories. But really, they're, they're sort of grounded in PR and trying to boost the stock prices of the companies they own. But what we do is we do a discipline that really isn't beholden to any of these structural pieces of today and that's what a lot of organizations are and really what i do when i start having these conversations is say that we have to really attack the idea that we've got a poverty of imagination 
I mean, when was the last time you, you played with new ideas within your business or were given time to do so? You're sort of focused on the here and now. The, the poverty of imagination is something that's spoken a lot um, by uh, my friends who work at UNESCO. So people like Lois Damhoff uh, out of Groningen in uh, the Netherlands and people like Riel Miller. These are some people that go into that. But really, it, we have to invite imagination back into our workplaces because we're, we're so stuck in the here and now that it's a real challenge and to frame that very simply with my clients I like to talk about shifting our mindsets from what is what's happening today what's happening next three months 18 months the things that are keeping us awake at night and, and causing us stress in our jobs the things that we can celebrate tangibly as well to what if it's an invitation to be curious and as we start to look at different ideas uh, of, of what our futures could become, then it's interesting to really invite that curiosity and creativity. And there's no rules when we start to think about, you know, the size and shape and, and the futures that we're all going to have and our kids are going to have and their kids and so on. Okay, so I'm going to get into the sort of the meat and the bones of the presentation, and this is called scanning signals. So we look for signals of change. These are distinct things that are happening out in the world. It might be a piece of technology that's, that's you know, changing how something works. It might be a, a cultural shift uh, in social media. Uh, it might be a, a way that geopolitically the world is shifting and changing. But these are distinct things that we can capture and research and bring together and start to say, okay, from a trend perspective how is the world changing okay i'm going to go through a number of different areas that i think might be interesting to you i've sort of pulled on some of the experience i've had with healthcare here in canada which is a very similar model to the nhs in the uk also down in the states and, and abroad as well so let's look at remote and autonomous healthcare there's been a huge uh, discussion around the use of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data, uh, and, and uh, learning uh, applied within um, surgical and medical contests. Um, recently, I chatted on radio on Sirius XM about the robot that performs the first uh, surgery without a human's help. Autonomous surgery has, has been sort of one of the holy grails um, of, of, of sort of the healthcare system. And uh, at, it was actually founded by a guy um, out in Vancouver in Canada. There's a lot of innovation in the area there. But it's really interesting to think about having, you know, 24-7, 365 capabilities. It's also uh, interesting to think about what it takes to train these machines and what oversight they need to have as well. Uh, what's interesting as well is that robotics as a whole has been sort of uh, that, that area that sort of stepped out of the, the shadows of science fiction and into the real world. And they've actually got some uh, real practical applications. Here's a very short video I did for another client that sort of uh, looks at two or three applications of robotics in healthcare. we start to think about robotics i mean how happy was that doctor in the uh, robot at the beginning as well I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not always going to be the case um it's like daleks in in the healthcare system but at the same time it's also super interesting to think about the connection that you can create um and the access to the workforce that can really support um the systems that we need and, and it's in incredibly interesting to think about this in, in remote locations it's also interesting to, to to play with ideas of futures around this um um, I talk about speculative fiction and immersive futures and futures design. And, and there are a number of artists out there that are really exploring what this could look like. This is sort of a really provocative video um, done by uh, a, a guy, a foresight practitioner called Dan K. Chen. Um, this is his end of life care machine. 
And this sort of is a little bit closer to home from the things that we've seen during the pandemic. But he, you know, this is from prior to the pandemic. It's like, you know, what if we can't always be there when someone is in the last minutes of their life? Hello, my friend. I am the end of life care robot. I have detected that you are near at the end of your life. But please don't worry. We will ensure that you have the best possible experience. I am here to help you and guide you through your last moment on Earth. I am sorry that your family and friends are not able to be here with you. But don't worry, I will do my best to comfort you. You are not alone. This is kind of the really fun part of futures. It, it's, 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 it's almost insane to think about this, but it's not so insane when we actually saw things uh, during the pandemic that were actually very similar versions of this. This, is, uh, this was out of Brazil, and I don't know if this was done in other parts of the world, but nurses would fill a, a glove, a surgical glove, with warm water and put it in the hands of, uh, of people that were dying, the hands of love, um, so that they were actually soothed in the last minutes of their lives. So this is when like futures gets really visceral. Some Someone like Dan K. Chen is exploring this idea and someone in real life realizes that there's an actual real application of, of, of that kind of uh, connection and support that can't be attained by humans just because there's not enough people around. Um, when we start to look at futures, this sort of uh, play is really interesting. Earlier last year, I spoke to an elder care community here in Canada, and uh, we went through a number of different areas. I really just wanted to touch on this as well. I don't like saying old people. I think elders actually pays heed to the, the knowledge and wisdom of the people that we should be looking towards for, you know, wisdom out in the world. But it's interesting, you know, I grew up in the UK, when I saw like a, a 75 year old when I was like in, in my teenage years, you know, in the 90s. They felt pretty old. Now, if you're if you're out in the world today, a 75 year old, you know, doesn't feel older than 65, right? I'm 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 turning 50 this year, and I certainly feel like I'm in my mid 30s. You know, there's this mindset as well as a physical capability, and a lot less greasy food and smoking cigarettes and drinking too much beer in the world. Um, but what's interesting is that you know, in elder care, it, it's about designing systems and support based on what you can do, not what you can't do. And one particular example of this is uh, Hogerbeek in uh, in the Netherlands, and it was a it was a, a small village for people with dementia that were it was designed specifically for them and they've got um, nurses and doctors on on hand to be able to help them and uh, now the residents are actually finding it to be beneficial to have these special facilities because they, they need less medication they've got places that really work for them they, they've built these cute little green grocers and post offices and banks and and bars and nightclubs and all sorts of stuff that really keeps people you know really really happy and engaged and it's really interesting but when we start to think about, you know, elder care and we're thinking about people from different generations, they look at the world and they learn about the world in completely different ways from from us that were born, you know, in sort of the computer age and, and the Internet age, um, you know, that was that was forced upon us at a university. I'm going to play a short video. And this video is from a uh, an agency that was out of Berlin. They used to call Vitamin. I can't. I think they're called Special Projects now. And what they they what they had was an opportunity to work with Samsung. And Samsung had designed a phone for for the older population, and it just wasn't selling well. And the feedback they were getting from focus groups was they couldn't use it. And the problem wasn't the phone and what they designed. In fact, it was a pretty good design. It was how they engaged those people to learn differently.
What I really love about this is that it it took an old medium that people that the users, the people that were going to be using this the Samsung phone, um, that, that they were used to, which was a book full of instructions and cleverly with the phone inside with very clear instructions on each page. It's all revolutionized the, the way that, you know, Samsung uh, actually looked at, at, at the onboarding experience around technology. They, they, there's deeply human things that we have to consider when we're actually implementing new systems and onboarding people. And, you know, the 700 page manual just doesn't cut the mustard anymore. So it, it's super interesting as an idea of reductionism to actually achieve engagement. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about cyborgism. One of the early conferences I did in Vancouver was called Cyborg Camp, and I did it with my friend Amber Case, who's a very well-known um, researcher from Portland that's worked with Harvard, MIT, and a number of other places. Um, I myself am a cyborg. Uh, you know, I've got a phone in my pocket that helps me access information. I've also gone to the next level and actually got a microchip implanted in my left hand that helps me open doors. Um, I'm a biohacker, uh, and, and I'm shameless about this. But it's interesting when we think about the role of technology in the world and looking at that example of the cell phone but this is someone that you may or may not know this is douglas engelbart in 1968 he did a demonstration of a personal computing um setup uh called the mother of all demos and he him him and his team they invented the mouse uh, a touchpad and they used desktop publishing video conferencing hyperlinking all the things that we have in in modern life and uh, back in 1968 all the people all, all the people in charge of the big computer companies didn't think that any of this would come to pass and now we've all got supercomputers in our pockets so go figure um and now we're in a world where you know augmented reality and you've probably heard the term metaverse sort of thrust in front of you by media and tv and whatever but you know things like magic leap which is the headset here um it, uh, are sort of promising to to deliver information layers and data in front of our eyes in new ways and uh, there's a speculative designer called keichi matsuda out of the uk that put this to get put together an idea of what that looks like there's like an eight to 12 minute video that you put together called hyper reality i'm just going to show you a couple of minutes i mean and ask yourself is this the kind of future that you want to have It's kind of interesting. It's like strapping New York Times Square to your face. Um, so this metaverse, this immersion, this new world, this bright new future is kind of slightly dystopian and slightly twisted. In fact, I use dystopic uh, planning as part of uh, um, the processes that I use for, for futures work. And that's what I'm writing about in my book as well. But what Keichi Matsuda saw was an opportunity to tell a story about what a future could be. And he raised a million uh, a million dollars on Kickstarter to be able to do this project, flew down to Medellin in Colombia, did this like wild vision of the future. Do go and check out Hyper Reality Keichi Matsuda. It's uh, fascinating and I, I won't spoil the ending. Okay, now we're in a point where like the, the cyborgism that we're finding in the world is actually being very, very useful, you know, so uh, they've been able to put, uh, they've been able to put electrodes in, in the spinal cords of, uh, of people that haven't been able to walk for a long time, and they've suddenly been able to walk. They've also been able to, um, like, restore the eyesight of people as well using, you know, these headsets and implants of second sight. There's also a warning here as well. Second sight have just announced in the last couple of weeks that they're no longer going to be supporting the platforms. So these 350 people that were suddenly given the gift of sight, um, the functionality of what they have implanted and what they use is going to deteriorate over time and eventually within probably you know two to three years can be completely unusable. So th there's a burden of responsibility in the solutions that we provide to the world if we do 
bring together that symbiotic uh, relationship of humans and technology, especially around it, around implanted technology. Um, we have to understand that, you know, we have to provide a lifetime of support for these things. I kind of hope someone uh, buys the IP for this and, and keeps it going forward. Unfortunately, if that does happen, they're going to start charging subscriptions for you being able to see, and maybe you'll have plans Monday to Friday. You can see weekends, you can't and whatever. It's an interesting world to speculate about. But this sort of leads us on to think about exponential exposure. Uh, so we've got increases in biological knowledge. That, that's a dimension that hasn't been sort of focused on around data so much as it is today. Computing power, data collection and exploitation, huge amount of growth in data, up to like 70% growth in the next few years. Something like 170 petabytes of, of data is going to be created every single year. That's, that's a huge amount of data. We're not even going to be able to exploit that. But when we've got biology, computing power, data together, that, that really is going to expose us to, you know, cyber criminals. And when we think about that and we can be uh, exposed to potential vulnerabilities, the network and psychological effects of these systems that we use, whether they're implanted or whether they're in the cell phone or whether they're within the organizations or healthcare systems we work in, you know, are, are incredibly vulnerable. And we've certainly seen the stories about cybersecurity breaches um, around the world, especially in healthcare and resources and whatever. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about ancestral ghosts as well. And um, what do I really mean about that? Well, I mean, uh, our ability to, to perceive the world. So right now, I'm perceiving about 40 bits of information per second consciously, but I'm subconsciously uh, processing about 40 million bits of information per second. Our subconscious is uh, is wild and fantastic. It also hides uh, a lot of trauma that we've experienced in our lives. It's incredibly complex and we're still trying to work out how it works. You know, we you probably know the term epigenetics. It's the idea that you ha actually have gene expression from the environment in which we live. We can actually change the environment and change our belief systems and reprogram how our brains are working. I actually do this um, ongoing with my life coach we use something called psych k to do that and i've done group therapy i work with a group that does does a lot of this it's the idea that you can actually change the expression of those genes and you can even start to affront you know medical conditions as part of that as well certainly interesting but really, if we start to look at trauma, there's been a narrative that's been pushed onto us um, over the last few years. This is a really interesting study, and they did this for English language, which is this graph. They did it for Spanish and German. It was very similar. Um, over the last 125 years, we found a massive jump in depressed and anxious language. And that's in books and social media. That's in the news and whatever. So we're kind of in a constant state of stress about how the world is. If it's not a pandemic, it's about Ukrainian invasion. If it's not about that, it's about you know the dire circumstances in our, in our friend and family groups as we have uh, fights on WhatsApp, right? Um, but what we found in England during the pandemic, about one in three people in England report having experienced at least one traumatic event. So, you know, it's kind of prevalent to see things like, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and whatever sort of being out in the population. There's a huge amount of people here in Canada. I suffered with uh, PTSD um, from the age of eight to about the age of uh, 40 when I lost my sister and uh, it wasn't treated. And I just thought that anxiety was that fuel that drove me forward. I was wrong. And uh, luckily I've been able to to work that out um, but there's also something really interesting happening as well and certainly a lot of it's happening in Canada and that's the use of psychedelics and this is obviously psilocybin magic mushrooms LSD ketamine MDMA a whole number of different things are being used to treat people with PTSD it's, it's proven to be incredibly uh exciting area to be looking at um, from a health and mental health care perspective okay and the happy final uh, group of things that I, I look at is the future pandemics that are going to come to us again. Um, when when the pandemic turned up, uh, none of us were really talking about it. It had been something that had been explored a lot in the foresight community. And in fact, within the the, the, the public health service in, in England, it had been explored as well. You may or may know about this report called Exercise Alice. And they looked at the, uh, the, the MERS uh, COVID virus uh, that was actually happening out of the Middle East. And, you know, they ex did an exercise, they looked at policies and issues, and they looked about, you know, what happened if there was an outbreak in England? And the lessons that came from that were pretty directional you know, we're going to need access to sufficient levels of appropriate P PPE, pandemic stockpiles. 
uh, early command and control, developing the capability for contact tracing, exploring new experimental therapies. Um, so in 2016, we could have taken this seriously and actually prepared for the pandemics that were going to happen, but no one did. <laughs> so we were sort of left on our own in the short term thinking and the knee jerk reactions that basically every government around the world exercise was really interesting. Um, and it really comes down to, you know, dealing with pandemics is around, you know, strong directional leadership, clear policy and civic duty. And unfortunately, the civic duty in Canada, UK and beyond was really, really lacking in a lot of places where you actually move to places like South Korea or Singapore, whatever, um, New Zealand as well, you certainly saw a lot of people stepping on board and you can see how they fared as well. But really, what I do with my work is, you know, take people through these signals, get people thinking, but really come back to strategic foresight as a capability. Once we create future narratives, we can build bigger vision and strengthen strategic planning and anticipate unforeseen risks today is remarkably useful. So, you know, finding those signals, building out hypothetical scenarios, thinking about speculative fiction, and some of the examples from Dan K. Chen and Keiji Matsuda sort of looked at that as well, but really considering a number of different dimensions of change and, and what, what initiatives and policies and whatever could be happening in 5, 10, 20 plus years is a really valuable exercise. I've been doing it with a lot of different clients over the years. And uh, one client I worked with was a large French aerospace company. And last year we wrote six science fiction stories on uh, on on different scenarios one was around heat in the middle east and how planes couldn't fly when it got too hot uh, and it was about the hyperloop there there was another one about biology in uh, in cellular protein and pig farming capabilities in china another was growing food in space and being able to ship that logistically to Mars. So this has really opened their minds. This organization, which is about 16 billion uh, euro organization per year, is now installing foresight as a capability across their organization. It's incredibly exciting. And when you start to do that, it's actually been found that you know organizations have been more effective, more profitable. They've got a higher market capitalization. And Rolbrack and Kuma out of uh, Belgium have done the study. You know, 33% higher profitability or 200% higher market capitalization on companies that invested in foresight. And I think we're starting to see some companies, you know, people like Tesla starting to really step up, um, people like Google and Amazon, whatever, that are really going deep on this work. And that's what this is all about. This is about shifting our mindsets from what is, because, you know, that's what we have to do every day. But without wondering what if um, our capabilities aren't as strong as they could be and i'd be happy to take some questions thank you so much